So welcome everyone to this Fane online event in celebration of Barbara King Solver's new novel, Demon Copperhead. Um, Barbara, it's just so wonderful to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really fun uh, to get together this way. Exactly, exactly. And I just, I have to say congratulations. Um, I, I read Demon Copperhead. I didn't read it. I just gobbled it up. Um, and as I was reading it, I mean, it's just such a page turner. And as I was reading it, I was I was really perplexed because I was thinking, oh, my God, this is my favorite of her books. Right. And then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, this is a really familiar feeling because I, fe I think that I've thought that after every single book that you've written. Anyway, this is my recent favorite of your books. So just congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. And of course, I love to hear that because as 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 writers, as you know, we always want our best book to be our next book. You know, it's a little <laughs> bit discouraging when when you know to hear, oh, I just my favorite was Poison with Bible. And you know, I wrote that 20 years ago, 23 years ago or something. And I I mean, thank you, and I'm glad and like catch up i think that i'm a better writer now than i was <laughs> i know at least that's the hope right yeah. it's, and and also it's it's we're so lucky this is don't we have the best job in the world yes. isn't, it, isn't it amazing it is. to get to be a novelist and yeah. I, I mean in college i was at that kid who wanted to major in everything yeah every, absolutely everything every class i took i thought I want to know everything about East Asian history or yeah. everything about you know chemistry. And so with with each new novel, you can't you get to major in something new. Yeah. It's sort of sort of like getting a PhD in a whole new subject. And it yeah. and it excites you so much and it pushes you to do stuff you've never done before. So so thank you. I want this to be, <laughs> you know. Barbara King saw his best. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I have to say that, you know, with every novel, you you do keep setting the bar higher and higher and higher for yourself. So this is something that, you know, I, I, you know, I would if I were in your shoes right now, I would feel very daunted. But I, I really admire the way that you um, have done exactly what you've done over the course of your career, that that you've you know, you've never you've never repeated yourself. You've always moved in, you know, onto something new in some brand new area. And I completely agree with you that the reason I write is to is to in, give myself the excuse to spend, you know, years learning about something else and and that's just been as you say it's been wonderful and and also to push yourself into new techniques new challenges to write from perspectives that are really difficult for you or to set up some kind of internal challenge within the novel that you know that you've never done before ideally that that nobody has ever done before and i i, I feel like of course you're of course i was daunted at the beginning I always am daunted at the, every time I begin a novel and set up, you know, sort of the scope of it, the 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 craft of it, the sort of the craft challenges, the whole kind of parameter, and then I look at it and say, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could do that, but that's where you want to be yeah. as a writer, flying by the seat of your pants. Your pants like that's... you just you just jump out of the airplane and hope the parachute will open. And the good thing is in our case, if the parachute doesn't open, we won't die. Um, That's right. Because like, if we write a horrible novel, it will not, it will not leave this room. Nobody will ever know, nobody will read it. But the best thing is you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not perfect in the beginning. Yeah. You just begin I always have to give myself permission to write a lousy first draft, you know, because of that feeling like, you know, you can be paralyzed by feeling this is going to be terrible. This is the one that's really, really going to be horrible. <laughs> you just give yourself permission to, to do it anyway. Anyway, just write the horrible first draft yeah. somewhere along the line, you hit your stride, yeah. you find your voice, you get to the end, and then you get to write it all over again, and again, <laughs> right. and again, and again, and it doesn't leave this room until it's until it's not horrible. Yeah, um, yeah, 
Yeah. So oh, that's, that's it's, the process. That's right. So much of what you said, I just, I, I want to just jump in and, and start to talk about all of the things that you just introduced. But before we do that, um, I, I would love to hear, you know, and share with the people who are, who are watching um, a little bit of you reading um, from, from Demon Copperhead, because, you know, of course, Demon Copperhead is, I'm sure people know this, but it's a, it's a, just an absolutely brilliant retelling of David Copperfield set in the mountains of Southern Appalachia. Um, and, you know, and I know that there's like a fascinating Genesis story here. So I definitely want to ask you about that. But the, the thing that, that strikes you from the very first line is the quality of the protagonist's voice, of Demon's voice and his attitude and his spunk, you know, and, and so this is what I'd, I'd love for viewers to, to um, you know, hear a little bit of, because novels always come to me as voices, and I suspect that's probably true for you too. So if you yeah. could just share a little of that voice with us, it would be wonderful. Okay, um, I will just begin at the beginning, because that way it needs no introduction. This is chapter one. First, I got myself born. A decent crowd was on hand to watch, and they've always given me that much. The worst of the job was up to me, my mother being, let's just say, out of it. On any other day, they'd have seen her outside on the deck of her trailer home, good neighbors taking notice, pestering the tit of trouble as they will. All through the dog breath air of late summer and fall, cast an eye up the mountain and there she'd be little bleach blonde smoking her palm oils, hanging on that trailing, uh, uh, sorry, hanging on that railing like she's captain of her ship up there and now might be the hour it's going down. This is an 18 year old girl we're discussing all on her own and as pregnant as it gets. The day she failed to show, it fell to Nance Peggett to go bang on the door, barge inside, and find her passed out on the bathroom floor with her junk all over the place and me already coming out. A slick, fish-colored hostage picking up grit from the vinyl tile, worming and shoving around because I'm still inside the sack that babies float in pre-real life. Mr. Peggett was outside idling his truck headed for evening service, probably thinking about how much of his life he'd spent waiting on women. His wife would have told him that Jesus -ing could hold on a minute. First, she needed to go see if the little pregnant gal had got herself liquored up again. Mrs. Peggett, being a lady that doesn't beat around the bushes, and if need be, will tell Christ Jesus to sit tight and keep his pretty hair on. She came back out yelling for him to call 911 because a poor child is in the bathroom trying to punch himself out of a bag like a little blue prize fighter. Those are the words she'd use later on, being not at all shy to discuss the worst day of my mom's life. And if that's how I came across to the first people that laid eyes on me, I'll take it. To me, that says I had a fighting chance. Long odds, yes, I know. If a mother is lying in her own piss and pill bottles while they're slapping the kids she's shunted out, likely the bastard is doomed. Kid born to the junkie is a junkie. If he wanted a shot at the finer things, he should have got himself delivered to some rich or Christian non-using type of mother. Anybody will tell you the born of this world are marked from the get out, win or lose. Me though. I was born sucker for the superhero rescue. Did that line even exist? I'm sorry, I'm gonna start that, chat, that sentence again. Me though, me though, I was a born sucker for the superhero rescue. Did that line of work even exist in our trailer home universe? Had they all quit Smallville and gone looking for the bigger action? Save or be saved, these are questions. You want to think it's not over till the last page. <laughs> and it isn't over to the last page. <laughs> you know, it's it's wonderful to hear you reading this. And it's also 
wonderful because of course now that i've read to the to the last page i can see how beautifully you have just laid out this territory your this this voice is you know is right there and it, he's going to bring us through to the last page and and you've you know you've you've really foreshadowed so many of the the elements that are going to come into the book i mean it's just it's marvelous it's wonderful to you know to have the whole thing in my head now and then also hear you read the beginning so thank you so much for that sure yeah now i'm just i have to start because you know a lot of readers have have sent in questions and one question that keeps coming up and it certainly was one of my questions too was what inspired you to to write you know to to take david copperfield and to cast him as a young child of a you know of a um, addicted single mom or not single i guess she is a single widow right at this yeah. point um mm -hmm. in in southern appalachia what how did these pieces come together and and how did you how did you choose dickens well it, dickens chose me I'll, I'll i'll tell you that's how it happened i i i start every novel with with an idea a a, a big question some some something that's worrying me, something that's keeping me awake at night, uh, like why can't we talk about climate change or, you know, sort of big, big questions. Uh, because if, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to ask readers to put down their life and listen mm -hmm. to me for whatever, 10 hours, it needs to be something worthwhile. It, it's, it matters. It needs to be about something that matters to, to me and, and, and probably to you. So the thing that has been worrying me for quite a while um, in this place where I live is the opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. the um, yes. terrible, terrible thing that was done to this region by Purdue Pharma um, quite deliberately. Um, we were targeted as a vulnerable population uh, for their, for the hard sell of their very addictive painkillers. And the consequences of that here are that we've got a generation of kids growing up uh, lost, uh, being raised by people other than their parents because their parents are, are um, incarcerated or dead. Mm -hmm. um, the, these lawsuits are getting settled and every, and then the national mm -hmm. tension is kind of shifting away. Okay, Purdue Pharma got theirs. You know, the, they're, they're disgraced. The, um, the, the settlements have happened. We're still living with it. Our schools, these kids are coming up in our in our school system, in our um, child welfare system, and they and and situation for them is desperate. Institutional poverty and its effects on on kids. Um, it's just something we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. Who wants to talk about it? Nobody. It's hard, it's dark, it's difficult. Um, it, 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 it brings in other questions like how, why this region? How has it been kept deliberately impoverished? How did our schools uh, come to be sort of substandard? What, how, is, how did it happen that this whole region is like an internal colony of the United States? It's hard stuff. And I knew that I wanted to write about it, but I didn't know how to get the reader inside the story. So I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I came up with no good solutions. And I was, um, I was, I, I was, I was ending up, I was ending the, my tour for my last novel, Unsheltered. Yeah. Um, the, the, the UK uh, tour was at the end of the, the US tour. So I was, it was in London and I had a weekend free. Uh, I had just like scheduled a couple of days of downtime before I flew home. And I had found online that Bleak House, where Charles Dickens lived, uh, and wrote David Copperfield was now functioning as a, an inn, a bed and breakfast, we would call it, or, or, or like a country inn. Like it's in Broadstairs. The real uh, Bleak House. The real the Bleak re House. <laughs> the real Bleak House where Charles Dickens right. lived. This is not something that would happen in the US. But so I was amazed and I said, okay, book, book me in. And my, and my husband had flown over to join me. So we had a couple of days in Bleak House. Well, there it was, we got off the train in this pelting freezing rain and storm clouds and it could not have been a more Dickensian day. Perfect. And we, walk, 
walk up to this bleak brick mansion kind of leaning over a cliff over the sea in broad stairs and I thought well how could this get more dramatic open the door and it did here is like Bob Cratchit is behind I mean, these, <laughs> these, this, the staff were like from, from central casting this guy behind the desk says what will it be and then little Dorit comes down the she's limping <laughs> literally limping this little tiny woman comes down the hallway offering to carry our suitcases up the three flights of stairs <laughs> and we said, no no I, I I've got it so we had the run of this place this creaky amazing bleak house they said sure you can just you know you can sleep in Charles Dickens's bed <laughs> and 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 go wherever see in the U.S. this would be all roped up you know exactly ropes. it was not I said even Dickens's study why why sure they said of course so I went in there and sat at Charles Dickens's desk <laughs> looking out the window at this stormy sea thinking, and this was the desk where he wrote David Copperfield. Unbelievable. His, his memorabilia, you know, his things were all over the room and, and on, you know, hanging on the walls and there's like some manuscript pages from David Copperfield. It was just like the presence wow. of the man was, was, was overwhelming. And so I just sat there thinking, this is, this is totally what he wrote about institutional poverty and what it does to kids and child labor and all of the things I wanted to write about that I thought nobody wanted to hear about. Do you think the Victorians, the polite Victorian society wanted to read about it? No. Did he get them lining up at the docks waiting for the, <laughs> the next installment? Yes. So I'm just like communing with the man saying, how did you do it? And he said, to me, this is, I've never spoken with a dead person before. He said, you let the child tell the story, which is everything because nobody doubts a child, right? That ur the urgency of it, the, the sort of raw truth telling of it from the child's voice is, is it, it's riveting. And so, I started right there that night. Well, I ran, I ran back to the room where, where Stephen was sleeping by this time. And I said, I've been talking to Charles Dickens. And he said, that's, that's, how did it go? <laughs> did, it, did it go well? I said, yeah, I think we're good. Um, and I got my pen and my paper and I went back to the desk and I started writing this book that night. I didn't oh start God. with like chapter one, I am born, but I started writing just like pouring out the outline of my David Copperfield who would be called who would have this nickname Copperhead because he has red hair because he's a Melungeon and he's um and he's a little dangerous because Copperheads I don't know if people know this in the UK but Copperhead is a dangerous mm. snake that lives in these mountains and um I just started mapping the whole thing out and I hadn't read David Copperfield for a number of years, I can't, I, you know, maybe 10 years. I'd read it a few times before, um, but I, 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 I read it again, you know, I got it out and I started, well, the nice thing is you have it in your, like your phone has every book yeah, that, you yeah. ever, that you want to read. So I started looking at it and realizing this is perfect chapter mm -hmm. and verse. I mean, starting with chapter one, I am born. Mm -hmm. Uh, the whole plot is there. All I had to do, all I had to do yeah. was translate, you know, like what is the Southern Appalachian modern equivalent of a boot black factory, yeah. you know, that employs children? Well, it's going to be a Golly's Market, a, a, a little market with a, with a, like a, a wildcat dump in the back that employs children and a meth lab back around the side. That's so, sort of like the, chi the child labor is, happens in the tobacco fields. It, it, it actually does. Children are used to work tobacco fields here um, or, or have, were until very recently. So every, he grows up to be, David Copperfield grows up to be a famous writer. That was not going to happen to my demon Copperhead. So I had to figure out some other profession that he would find his, some creative thing that he would find his way into that would sort of give his, kind of rocket him, his, his, his thinking outside of his very sort of narrow circumstances. Yeah. All of these things I had to translate yeah. But it was so much fun 
to, to work with, like to sit right here at this desk where I'm sitting right now, I have my hands right now on the keyboard where I write. And Charles Dickens was like right here. He was sitting <laughs> next to me the whole time. And he wrote my first draft, which is the hardest part. Yeah. Um, and like, if you're gonna outsource your first draft, he's your man. Yeah. I mean, the plot, the plot of David Copperfield is just so good and the characters are so funny. So I just had to bring that, you know, bring, bring that here. Yeah. And it's important to say that you do not have to read David yeah. Copperfield to read. I mean, this book, you know, it has, it stands on its own. Yeah. It's its own thing. But if you, if you read it and then you read David Copperfield, you're gonna you're gonna be in on a lot of private jokes. <laughs> there, there's just these beautiful little Easter eggs that are just hidden throughout the book that just make it even more delicious as you, as you read because of course you know there's this process of constant recognition. But as you say, you know I I hadn't read David Copperfield for you know for years, but uh, as soon as I finished this, I went back to it again. Um, so it's 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 wonderful and and you know that sense of fun that you describe, um, you know, it's, it, it is a very difficult book. I mean, there, there are, you know, really just heartrending passages in there and, and um, you know, and, and uh, Demon's life is, is a hard life, but there's a, also a sense of, um, of just vitality and energy and, and fun in it. Right, Demon's language is is just so beautiful, and I I did have this sense that you had that you were having fun writing it, and that you weren't writing it alone. That there was you know that you had you had a companion with you, and it was is it was you know it was Charles Dickens. Um, but having said that, so you must have had to read David Copperfield like you must have had it open on the desk next to you. I mean it it. You must have had to read that so often, and it's so interesting because this kind of picaresque, um, you know, episodic um, writing, it, it, uh -huh. you know, that you find in yeah. David Copperfield, is not something that I think of, you know, when I think of your plots, because you know, your plots are usually more embedded and interlinked in different kind of kinds of ways. And of course, Dickens uh -huh. was writing this as a serial novel, right? So right. it had to come out in this kind of episodic way. And, and uh -huh. it works just beautifully. I mean, you just, you know, it, it pulls you from, you know, from chapter to chapter and from year to year. But I'm just curious, in a way, it's like, writing something like this must have been like taking a master class from Charles Dickens. And I'm just writing, like, what did you learn? And what can you share with us? <laughs> well, you're, you're absolutely right. Not, not only did I have it open on the desk, I actually opened an Excel file. I did, I, you know, an Excel file and I just broke it chapter by chapter by chapter and then filled in my, because his chapters are, are short. Uh, there are, I think, 65 chapters in, in uh, David Copperfield. And then I sort of, before I really started writing, you know, sort of the chap, the, the writing beginning to end, uh, creating scenes, I wrote a few sentences for each chapter of my ideas or of how how that would translate, what, mm -hmm. what my version would be. And so it, it, it tracks, it tracks Dickens' nice. it, novel almost perfectly. There are a couple of chapters where he got a little ahead and I got a little behind, but uh, overall, right down to the very last one where the same thing that happens to, to David Copperfield happens to Poor Demon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I learned a lot of, from that about pacing I found yeah. that always kept moving me forward and also how to like create little cliffhangers at the end uh -huh. the chapters are uh on average about eight eight pages long eight manuscript pages and so how to make a whole sort of how to visualize an eight page chapter as a kind of scene sometimes more than one scene happens but a sort of uh like a little episode with a beginning, middle, and end, and the end needs to be a cliffhanger. So that even though the chat, so the reader kind of, uh, I mean, most of us probably read with an idea of where the chapter is going to end and we're going to read that far. And so my goal was to get them that far and then get them into the next chapter too. So it really, it's, it's, a, it's a technique that really pushes the reader forward, which needs to happen because this is, 
it's a, it's a I think I think the the British call it a doorstopper. Yes, it's a um, doorstopper. Uh, it is. <laughs> we would just call it a big ass book, um, <laughs> but it's 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 big. It's long. Yeah. It's a lot happens, and a lot needed to happen. I mean, it needed to be this long because as I got into it. As you say, this is it's it's fun. It's sort of jolly fun, but it's also really dark, really dark. terrible, yeah. Yeah. terrible things yeah. happen yeah. to demon that are absolutely re realistic. Um, addiction, child labor, the 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 pretty horrendous um, child protective services system, mm -hmm. the the whole foster care system that he gets pulled into, and of course th there are good foster parents. Of, there are mm -hmm. you know people who are in it absolutely. Um, uh, from from the best the, the best uh, and kindest motives, but there are also because the system is so terribly overstretched here, especially mm -hmm. all services are terribly overstretched here. There are people in it who are just in it for the the money that they get and the the work the labor they can get out of the kids, and that's what happens to Demon, yeah. um, and it's real. Uh, every uh, the, uh, so many people. Uh, have become addicted following doctor's orders from an injury, a sports injury. In his case, it's a football injury. They they do exactly as they're instructed. And when they get to the bottom of that bottle of 30 pills, their brains have been altered by opium. So they will be sick unto death unless they keep getting their opioids. And that's what happens. And so that leads, of course, to a really, really desperately difficult and dangerous life. So there were months, I mean, I'm glad you felt that sense of fun because I mm -hmm. wanted it to be like mm -hmm. that. Wanted to, you know, as an artist, you want people to see the art, but not to feel the work that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I always say it's like watching ballet. You want to see these, these the dancers uh, defying gravity. You don't want to see that their feet are bleeding, yeah. um, <laughs> but they are. And my feet were bleeding. Yeah. I mean, metaphorically, there were so many days when I came to this desk and thought, what do I have to do to Demon today? Poor <sighs> kid. I mean, I love him. And he makes so many choices that you just know are really going to be all, they're going to end up, leave him in a terrible place. And he, he sees people die. His yeah. people he loves die left and right. So it was really hard. There were dark, dark um, the passages in the, in the, I guess, three years I was writing this where it was hard to go to work, I had to learn about really hard things. I had to learn a lot about uh, about drug drug addiction mm -hmm. and just the, the 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 logistics. You know, this pill. How do you get this pill mm -hmm. into your veins? What are the steps? You know, to mm -hmm. describe that to me. So I had to do. I had to talk with a lot of people who know those things, mm -hmm. who have been there, who've lived this life. And I can also tell you that this is this is all real. Everything that happens to Demon mm -hmm. in this book has happened to someone I have known. So mm. it's like one degree of separation between me and every one of these really, really awful things that happen to the, to the kids in this novel, um, which makes it all the more sort of, you know, painful mm -hmm. to write. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 my goal of course, is to create empathy for the people, not just kids, not just teenagers and young people, but also older people. There are a lot of elderly addicted uh, um, people with opioid use disorder in this community, just because they, you know, they were on disability. These drugs were really pushed at them, and and then it happened. Um, so there's such stigma, you know, against that life and those the those those people that I needed to get you in there somehow so you could feel uh emotionally how hard that life is and that nobody chooses it on purpose yeah and and you you do that i mean that's one of i think the just the brilliant things about this book is that it, it you know you you as a reader i just fell into demons you know, into his language, into his way of seeing the world. And it, you know, and, and, you know, as I said before, there's just something so vivid and so, you know, alive about his voice um, that even when 
you know, terrible things would happen to him. Um, and, and there were times where I did have to put the book down. I just, I just felt like, oh my God, I know what's going to happen. Don't do that. You know, <laughs> you know and 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 you know so I would put the book down and I'd walk away and go you know wash the dishes or something and then you know an hour later be right back again because I just couldn't stand it you know it's like I need I need to find out what's going on with him you know um and you know and so this is this is something that uh I want to talk you know about the sort of social issues but I also just you know there were many people and and myself included who are just interested interested in um, the the quality of that voice and the, the poetry in that voice. And, and um, you know, I think Dickens, I think, said something about how, you know, that, he, you know, a writer's most potent tool is point of view. Yeah. And right. And and this is so true in this book. It's the point of view of this character um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that makes it so compelling. And um, I, I just have a, a question here from a reader. Um, Demon's voice has all the pluckiness and bravado of David Copperfield, but is utterly unique, completely immersed in the cadence and subtleties of its culture. Um, and then somebody else says, you know, Demon's first person narrative is what carries the reader through the triumphs and, and tragedies of his very hard life. And this is you know, absolutely true. I was just struck by, you know, the gorgeousness of his language and the, the sort of, you know, mind altering sort of metaphors that he uses that really made me see and made me conceive of the world slightly differently as a result of that. And, and so could you talk a little bit about the, you know, I mean, Dickens was the inspiration for the overall, you know, structure of the book and the characters, but where did that voice come from? Where does that language and that poetry come from? That language comes from right here, yeah. uh, where I live and where I grew up. Um, and yeah, there, I had to decide early on to, to, to sort of separate Demon from David um, sort of in terms of a kind of psychic position, um, mm -hmm. David Copperfield is, is, is very, always very hopeful and a bit naive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when Murdstone comes, you know, comes to, uh, comes around, start his, his, becomes his stepfather, David Copperfield is like, he seems like a good man, you know, we hope this will work out. Demon is like, no. I had my instructions. No way. I'm yeah. not, you know, this, this man is bad news. He's much more demon is, is more cynical. Um, he's more worldly. He had to be, you know, David Copperfield would, he would just be crushed in modern times. This kid had to be more of a modern kid. He's, he is more, kids are just more worldly now, um, no matter where they live. So he has his point of view. He has his, um, He's resilient mm -hmm. um, as his, at some point he's, he's sent to, you know, when he goes to a new school, he sees the counselor and the counselor, you know, the guidance counselor goes through his, his massive records of all the stuff he's been through. And he says, you are resilient. And demon says, he, he doesn't know what that is. He says, do you give me medicine for that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because he's just used to whatever whatever adults tell him it's probably bad yeah um but he is resilient some kids are no matter what they just keep believing they can or keep trying keep fight you know keep fighting um and so he has that going for him which also as did david copperfield i'll give him credit but um but his language his the way he says mrs peggett was one of those ladies that would just tell Jesus to keep his pretty hair on until she gets her job done. That's how people talk here. Demon's language is my first language. I grew up in Kentucky um, uh, and now, I, and I lived a bunch of places in between, Paris, France, uh, I lived in Greece, I lived in Tucson, Arizona, but this was always home and I had to come back here and I've lived here uh, for 20 years and I will be in this house um, until, until, as my mama used to say, they take me out in the box. Um, so that is the language I know. We mm -hmm. are storytellers. Everybody tells stories. They tend to be funny and self-deprecating mm -hmm. and also just habits of speech. Like we always say, whenever, and for whenever, 
for, for you, when and whenever probably have two different meanings, but we just say whenever. Uh, whenever I went to the store yesterday, um, um, you know, so all these all these small habits of speech, some of them, some of them might have seemed a little strange. You have to get your ear around them, but then they get they he has this English teacher in high in in school who's trying to trying to tell the kids, you know, what no, whenever and when mean two different things, and they're just like. <laughs> He'll figure it out eventually. You know, just like this, this guy, he's not from here. He doesn't know how to talk. He's uh, the, the, when they say tarred, their English teacher says and feathered. Um, yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah, yeah. understand. We're saying we're tarred. Um, tired, right, so, right? Yeah, right. Tired. So, um, so as a writer, you have to use these little tricks to get the reader to hear how. Uh, how the characters are pronouncing words because mm -hmm. I don't use I mean the there's this thing I call it Uncle Remus language mm. where people intentionally misspell words to try to show a, a dialect part particularly a southern or an Appalachian dialect and I find that incredibly condescending yeah. so so I have to use other little tricks rhyming tricks and different you know or an outside listener and how they don't understand I have to just use other ways to show you um how words are you know how the language is sound, sounding of course on the audiobook you'll just get that but um but um I, I i mean i just can't stress enough how much i love the language of southern appalachia and how rich it is and part of i mean a big part of this project actually it became the overarching motive of this book as i got into it more and more I realized this is what I want to do here really is write the great Appalachian novel to, to help counter this incredibly condescending stereotype that we live with here all the time. People don't even realize it. I mean, for one thing, there is an urban rural divide in this country and rural people are really not represented very much in media at all in in entertainment media, on television in movies when's the last time you saw an honest realistic movie about farmers and what mm -hmm. they really do uh, not romanticized not brutalized but real it just doesn't happen rural people just don't show up much uh in our media because they are all made in cities um appalachian even worse if we ever show up, it is as the butt of the joke, yeah. um, the, Bever the Beverly Hillbillies deliverance and, you know, the modern equivalents, which are reality shows as a yeah. joke or as um, an object of pity in a sort of a poverty yeah. documentary, not as real people, nuanced people, complex, a complex culture and a rich culture. And, and, and people who of great resourcefulness, you know, I, I need to put that on the map. I'm, I'm only one person, but it's, but I'm doing my best. And, sh and, and, and in modern times, these characters that I wrote about are well aware of how mm -hmm. the world sees them. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. this self-awareness that Demon has these little, at the ends of several, many chapters, he kind of goes into a little musing about, like one is about tobacco, like yeah. what city people think about tobacco versus, you know, what it really is here where we live. And, and he talks about, you know, what, like, we 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 can see you on tv <laughs> making fun of us you know talking to like making jokes about how we all are you know having sex with animals and marrying our cousins do you think we don't even have cable <laughs> i loved that we, we moment can hear you. <laughs> we can hear you i love yeah. that moment so, yeah so there's this little sort of breaking of the fourth wall yeah. um that's an, another thing that that Charles Dickens did a oh. number of times in David Copperfield when he David Copperfield would just say can you see how hard I work I really <laughs> am a good person even though I'm poor so yeah so that's um, great so so as it went along I got I sort of as you do in a novel I started um, thinking about how you know this all came from somewhere the reason the schools here are substandard. The reason unemployment mm -hmm. is so enormously high in this region 
is it's poverty by design. The coal companies deliberately uh, prevented other industries from coming in. They deliberately kept the schools really sort of kept very low standards in the schools so that people would grow up with no choice but to be coal miners, coal, mm -hmm. excuse me, to be coal miners. And, and it goes back even farther. It goes, it goes back to the whiskey rebellion. And I started thinking about this whole sort of structural, cultural um, sort of uh, prejudice against rural people, the whole kind of cultural campaign to, to cast rural people as this struggling, uh, like, it, like sort of living provisional lives because they're still providing for themselves. They haven't really arrived at real, uh, you know, real life, which city mm -hmm. people live. Right. And feeling how how true that is, even now, I feel that all the time when mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. city friends ask me, "How can you live so far from everything?" Well, define everything. <laughs> I mean, I don't leave. I didn't leave this hollow for two years, and I was really happy. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's really oh, that's that's so interesting. And this is something that um, some of the readers had picked up on. Um, one reader said, uh, wrote in, flight behavior seemed to me to deal with questions of class with such respect and care. It's something English readers think of as being a very English concern. But do you think class divides are uh, as alive and as divi uh, divisive um, in the US um, as they are in the UK? And, and I think you just answered that, that question question um that question really beautifully yeah absolutely and I would I mean absolutely we're dealing with class divisions here and I think in some ways it's more insidious here mm -hmm. because we all grow up with the myth of a classless society supposedly we have this completely egalitarian public school system which is not at all egalitarian so we are you know sort of those of us who are belong to the struggling class, the lower caste, caste the, 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 the um, rural class, carry the extra onus of feeling like it's our fault. Mm -hmm. If we're mm -hmm. not, if we're not wealthy, it's because we didn't work hard enough right. or we weren't smart enough. So that just, it's, it's very, it can be very self-defeating when you hear, when you live with this condescension all the time, yeah. it gets inside. And um, yeah, and uh, I, you know, and I was, it was really interesting to deal with that in, uh, through characters who are mm -hmm. in school and who are trying to, you know, who are, who are trying to cope with this teacher who's telling them, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. And they're like, what do you mean? But okay, they're, the Northern Virginia kids are smarter than us, but we could beat their asses, you know, in football. <laughs> so it's just like, it gets in you and yeah. your values become constructed around the condescension of, of the culture. Right. Right, right. Well, that's and and of course, then we see that reflected in American politics all the time. I mean, it, right. it, it's yeah, right. yeah. It, it's exactly the the kind of flavor of the divide in in U.S. politics too. Um, I no, oh, sorry. Oh, and I was going to say that I have, you know, I don't, I, I live among rural people and that this is one of the reddest parts of the country. I live among people who vote differently mm -hmm. from me. Um, and we won't mention any like, names of mm -hmm. former presidents or anything, but I completely understand their frustration, frustration. when yeah. you when you live with this condescension and you feel like the 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 the, the, the overstructure and the infrastructure of the country has completely ignored and forgotten you. Mm -hmm. When you hear enough that you are worthless, you mean nothing in this mm -hmm. country. You want to blow something up, mm -hmm. and if somebody comes along and says, "I'm going to blow it up." you're willing to go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really get it. Yeah. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, you, you, you managed to, you know, invoke and, and, you know, bring all of these issues into the book in such a, I don't know how to, I don't know exactly how to say it because it's certainly not understated. It's very much there, but it never feels, you know, it never feels oppressive in a kind of, you know, didactic sense at all. It's just seamlessly woven into the fabric of the, you know, the, the air that these characters breathe, the, the texture of their everyday lives. And, and, you know, so we learn 
about that as we're reading and, and never really understand that we're learning anything, but we do, right? And and well, so this, and, you don't, and you don't yeah. have to. I mean, you could right. just read it for a good story. Well, I mean, but, that's just it. But, it's a but that's it's, all. Yeah, yeah. But it's like it has all of all of this all of this stuff has to be. It has to come out of plot and character. So it's sort yes. of lived through the characters, and you're already sort of in the lives and in the dilemmas of the characters before you step back just just for example his uh demon's girlfriend dory has to drop out of of, of high school so that she can take her very sick father Mm -hmm. to his appointments because here where i live and this is the truth the nearest heart lung specialist is in another state when i've had to take my kids to various specialists at different times when there were you know medical issues i would have to drive them up to up to seven hours to Mm -hmm. see just you know sort of uh, the kind of specialist that people in cities could could find probably mm-hmm. 15 minutes from their home. So mm-hmm. this 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 is like just medical care, healthcare delivery and how it is how difficult it is mm-hmm. and how this is a very real situation that that a girl would have to drop out of school to take her father to mm-hmm. uh, his doctor's appointments. You're sort of already there and you're living with this family and seeing how that works before you have time to step back and say, oh, wow, this is a terrible injustice that rural people are just, just have horrifically poor access to medical care. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's the way you do it. You sort of get the reader into a life rather than standing back and giving them facts. Exactly. And, and, and that's what, I mean, that's what fiction does so beautifully is that we can, yeah. you know, we can see the world and, you know, through through these characters' eyes and we can experience it through their bodies. Yeah, um, it, it's 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 just beautiful. And the the um, supporting cast too, you, you mentioned Dory and I just kind of teared up because her story is so tragic, but she's such a, she's such a beautiful character, you know, and her, and and the relationship between Dory and, and Demon is just, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. I'm getting all choked up right now. Well, it's, it's, they're so young and this yes. Thing, yes. And, and that is also the truth of Appalachia. I mean, yeah. this life, life gets hard really early. And so this yeah. is so completely realistic that this, you know, these teenagers are trying to function as adults in this, you know, just like pathetic everything pitiful housing they're 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 drug addicted they're trying to and he has this he has this self-consciousness about it he's he's a cartoonist by this time he's right yeah. he's making up he's drawing little cartoons and he's super invented, superhero cartoons. superheroes yeah, yeah superheroes yeah. um but then he 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 makes this cartoon about their lives called he called the the incapables um because he really he really he sees how they're floundering, but he, he has no choice. I mean, you know, the, the that's what's that's what's so amazing about him, though, too, is that he he does use his experience and transforms it into his art, right? His mm-hmm. stories, his his mm-hmm. graphic novels, his graph, you know, his comic books, right? And mm-hmm. um, and and I think this is the you know, this is the beauty of the first person narrative, because, you know, a first person narrative is by definition, a narrative of survival. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, dear reader, you know, I have lived to tell the tale. And I think that's what makes us, you know, we see his hopefulness, we see his tenacity, his resilience, and we trust that we trust him to take us through, you know, to the end of his story. And, and it works. It's just beautiful. It's triumphant really is well and then and then another important thing i realized about the first person in addition to everything that you just said that it's somehow much more compelling to say this happened to me than Mm -hmm. uh, imagine this happened to somebody but the other thing is that as bleak as things get and as dangerous as his life becomes He's telling the story. So he, yes. at least subconsciously, at some in some part of your, your mind, you've already understood he's gonna survive. Exactly. He's telling the story. That's right. That's right. Dear reader, I have survived to tell the tale. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. And and so this I think brings me to my last question because I'm just looking at the clock and thinking that I could <laughs> yeah, talk to you so. forever, but you know, people have lives. Um, you know, you and I met. Um, I think 
back in 1999. Um, I think it was the first year of the Bellwether uh, Prize for Socially mm -hmm. Engaged Fiction. Could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about the Bellwether Prize? Because I mean, the, you know, other than the fact that it, it introduced me to, to you, <laughs> it has a lot of other benefits too. <laughs> and and, um, and the, the way that you're thinking about um, and and encouraging bringing up gener a gener you know generations of young uh, novelists who are thinking in these terms um, you know and and writing stories that are engaged with you know the the real stuff of the world um, I, I think is really beautiful so if you could just tell us a little bit about that it would be great thanks thanks yeah. Ruth for bringing that up um, yeah I just I uh, in 1999 when um, to my immense surprise, uh, the world uh, provided me with more money than I needed to, to, to survive. I just had expected to be a starving art, artist forever. <laughs> of course. Uh, and then suddenly I wasn't starving. So I thought, well, what else could I do that would be helpful for the world and helpful for other writers like me who want to use this medium, this magical medium to create empathy for for the other, um, you know, which I feel like is the antidote to, to most problems, you know, war, for Absolutely. example, you know, empathy for for people, for the theoretical stranger and and fiction that engages people with the, the questions of the world. Um, because at that time, I feel like this has changed in tw in 22 years, but at that time, Literature of that kind was really difficult to remember uh, to, to get published. You know, it was sort of like there were, it's like in in the United States, art and politics got a divorce in the McCarthy era That's in the right. in the in the forties, uh, and really never never got back on speaking terms. There was just this immense. Um, uh, uh, mm, there was a distaste and a distrust, a distaste. right? Yeah, For distrust. anything, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Distaste yeah. and distrust of any uh, literature, any art that sort of pulled you in the direction of thinking about, you know, sort of the, the, the questions of the world, which is so weird because everywhere else in the world, that's what artists do in Latin America, right. you know, in Africa. It's, that's the literature that gets Nobel Prizes. Here it was like, ew. Oh, ew we don't do that. Be, it's yeah. you're trying to be political. Ew. Yeah. So I thought, what could I do? I could create a prize for a first novel manuscript that would bring a, that that of this kind of literature that brings a, a person who wants to be a writer into the world as a writer because the it's a twenty five thousand dollar prize and with that comes with guaranteed publication. Yeah. So it's a career founding award and we get we uh, award it every other year and it has been going on for 23 years now. And so that means 12 new writers are in the world and I'm, I'm friends with all of them. Yeah. They're great people and they go on to do more work. Yeah. And uh, it's just so satisfying. I love, I love, uh, and and you were invited to, uh, to be one of the judges. Of I was, I think prize. I was one of the first judges and we one chose, of the first judges, yeah. right. we chose so, Donna Gershton's Kissing the Virgin's Mouth. You remember? Which is, yeah. yes. And yeah. it's um, a, an amazing novel still, yeah. still is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. And, and that's one of, that's another great thing. This has uh, brought this by choosing judges who are, you know, sort of uh, have a good understanding of this kind of work. It's brought me together with a community of other other writers who who are of similar mind yeah. and i also would say this kind of this kind of fiction is getting it's much more mainstream mainstreamed now it, it's much more respected it really has i mean i think the whole tenor has changed um mm -hmm. because i remember you know my first novel was my year of meats and i think that was probably what you know, uh, that's probably why I was a judge for, for, um, you know, the, the prize. Yeah, it is. That's why yeah. I invited you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 but I remember at the time it was, you know, there, there was a sense of like, ew, you know, ew, a po you know, politics, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and for yeah. every, every time you would sit down with an interview, yeah. they would ask, can you really do this? 
It's like, are you allowed? <laughs> right. right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I remembered um, Kurt Vonnegut um, had this, uh, this, it was his canary in the coal mine theory of the arts. Are you familiar uh -huh. with that? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. That art, the artist's role, that artists are really not good for much, but that what we, you know, that, that we are very sensitive. We're like super sensitive. And so we're like the canary in the coal mine, you know, starting to squawk and flap and keel over, you know, when the, <laughs> when the air gets bad, right? right. <laughs> and, right. and that's okay. how we can serve People, society. Right. Right. <laughs> People, there's something not right about this. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's, that's right. our job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, 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 you know, said that that you know that we're not good for much, but that we should be valued as alarm systems. You know. <laughs> Right. So anyway, I think we should probably wrap it up there. But my goodness, this has been such a just such a delight to, to talk to you. And congratulations on this this amazing new book. I hope that Demon goes out and just conquers the world. I'm sure he will. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruth. This was really, really fun. And yeah. thanks um, to the audience for watching. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for, for participating in this. Happy yeah. reading, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>